One of the first things we have to deal with in introducing biochemistry is the idea of organic and inorganic molecules. Most of what you've dealt with in chemistry classes so far have probably been inorganic molecules. But how do we tell the difference? The original definition of an organic chemical was pretty organic. Chemicals made by or from living things like proteins or sugars or uh, the swamp gas that you can capture and burn from a swamp. Uh, obviously made by the living things in the swamp. The original definition of inorganic was chemicals obtained from non-living things. Uh, sea salt or minerals that you can get from rocks or uh, carbon dioxide and other gases you can pull from the air. Uh, but then somebody came along and uh, uh, eventually Uh, someone came and uh, artificially uh, produced a chemical called urea. Uh, in a chemical lab, this rocked the chemical world. Suddenly, organic chemicals could be made without needing living things. Uh, so, of course, we needed new definitions. Some possible new definitions, uh, people noticed that all organic chemicals had a backbone or skeleton of carbon. So inorganic chemicals would be chemicals without carbon, right? But what about silicon carbide, like we use for carbide tipped drills, drill bits, or sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, those both have carbon. How about all carbon is uh, bonded to sponge atoms, like we mentioned in class the other day, the sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen that make up 99% of, of all molecules in living things. So would any carbon bonded to a sponge atom be organic? What about CO2? That's typically considered an inorganic chemical. Or uh, carbonic acid, H2CO3, that's also typically considered inorganic. So you could notice that carbon in organic chemicals is mostly bonded to hydrogen with some oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, or sulfur. Now we're starting to get somewhere. So the working definition we'll have for organic chemicals in my class is that an organic chemical consists of a chain or ring of carbon atoms. So you could have, uh, you could have carbon, 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 or you could have carbon, 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 carbon in a ring. Uh, however you arrange them, you've got this kind of backbone or skeleton of carbon atoms, mostly bonded to hydrogen, uh, with the remainder of bonds to uh, an occasional oxygen or uh, maybe a nitrogen. Okay, no metal ions anywhere to be found. And typically, these would be medium to large molecules. We don't have that many organic molecules that are just a single carbon with a few hydrogens, though that is an organic compound. Uh, so what would inorganic compounds be? Typically, a mix of metal and nonmetal atom, atoms. If you, can, if you look at a chemical formula and you notice that it's bonding things kind of across the periodic table, that's usually a good sign that it's inorganic. If it contains those sponge atoms, they're only in certain patterns, uh, phosphate, PO4, or nitrate, NO3. And typically, these are going to be very small molecules, only a handful of atoms, not the very large structures that you see in organic chemicals. Now, there's one other factor about organic chemicals that is important to note. Organic molecules can link up to form very large molecules. Uh, we call them a small molecule if they're only uh, a dozen or two dozen atoms, but they can link up into atoms that are uh, hundreds or, or thousands of atoms large. One way to do this is called a condensation or dehydration synthesis reaction. So imagine that you had uh, a chemical, an organic chemical that was uh, basically a circle 
with uh, an OH sticking off the end. And you had another atom that was basically a diamond with uh, an OH sticking off the end. You could uh, kind of cross eliminate these OH groups and you end up with uh, circle O diamond linked together plus an H2O that you've kind of cross eliminated from the two molecules. Can you see why that is called a dehydration reaction? You're pulling a water out of those two molecules, so you're sort of dehydrating them. Uh, it's also where the word condensation comes from, is that you're condensing water from these molecules. So if you repeat that basic condensation reaction many, many times, you can end up with a molecule that looks like circle, diamond, circle, square, circle, many, many others, long chain. These arrangements of small molecules into larger ones have special names. So the individual monomers, the circle, the diamond, the square, those are called monomers because mono means one. When you start linking them together, circle diamond, for example, or circle square, or you know, diamond square for that matter, those are called dimers, for uh, where di means two. And you can also have trimers. Uh, you can have uh, oligomers for a few things put together. Eventually, you start getting into these big molecules where you have circle, diamond, circle, square, diamond, circle, circle, dot, 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 on forever. This is called a polymer, where poly is Greek for many. So whatever a mer is, you can have one for monomer, two for dimer, or many for polymer. And the bottom line of this story here is that all biomolecules that we'll be dealing with, all four kinds of biomolecules, are organic. And most biomolecules, at least most of the interesting ones, are arrangements of monomers into bigger molecules. So we're now going to look at all four of the major classes of biomolecules. And in most cases, we're going to talk about the monomers and how they get arranged into bigger molecules. The first group of biomolecules we're going to talk about, because they're chemically the simplest, are the lipids. Now, lipids have a basic pattern that we call hydrocarbon. You have carbon, 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 with, uh, and those carbons are surrounded by hydrogen, 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 and so forth. Now, what do you remember about molecules that are mostly carbon and hydrogen? lots of nonpolar bonds, right? So nonpolar covalent bonds are largely going to be, uh, are all going to be hydrophobic. So these are, the, the group of lipids is going to be very hydrophobic molecules. They come in two chemical subtypes. Uh, the first is uh, fatty acids and their derivatives. Okay, so an example of a fatty acid uh, might look like carbon, 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 double bond, carbon, 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 double bond, carbon, carbon, uh, carbon, carbon, and then we get a double bond oxygen, OH at the end. Uh, this long non-polar uh, non section is the fatty 
part and this carbon double bond OOH is the acid part and that's why they are called fatty acids. Now if you take uh, a glycerol molecule, three carbons, and you stick on three fatty acid chains, this is what we call a triglyceride, also known as a fat or an oil. If you take uh, the same glycerol molecule and you put a phosphate group on one end and then two fatty acids, this is what we call a phospholipid. Phospholipids are very important in forming cell membranes. And if you take a certain uh, fatty acid and you loop it around in a chain like this, um, you end up with a molecule that can be made into a number of useful signaling molecules called eicosanoids. Eicosanoids. The other chemical subtype is the, uh, the sterols and steroids. Um, and the sterols and steroids, the basic idea is that you've got four carbon rings, and I'm not going to do them justice with a complete drawing here, but then a long chain that comes off of those four carbon rings here. Um, this basic molecule is cholesterol, but if you chop off that long chain and you make a few modifications, you can turn it into what we call steroid uh, molecules such as the steroid hormones. The properties, sorry you can't see this because I wrote over it, um, all lipids and uh, are hydrophobic and they all contain many high energy bonds. That's why they are so useful for energy storage is that, uh, let me see, Erase this here for a moment. Okay. Um, all lipids are hydrophobic and they contain many high energy bonds. Um, that's why triglyceride fats and oils are used so much for uh, energy storage by so many different organisms. Uh, some quickly uses roles in the body. Triglyceride fats or oils are used for energy storage, insulation, and for padding. Uh, phospholipids and cholesterol are used to form cell membranes. Steroid hormones are used for stress management and sexual development. Uh, and eicosanoids, uh, such as the prostaglandins, uh, are used as local signaling molecules that manage inflammation and other body processes. Carbohydrates are the next most complicated uh, set of molecules. Their chemical pattern takes the carbon and hydrogen pattern and adds oxygen. So we have carbon, oxygen, hydrogen roughly in a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio. To, in this class, we're primarily going to be concerned with 6-carbon hexose sugars and their, uh, their MERS, monomers, polymers, and dimers. So a uh, stereotypical 6-carbon hexose is glucose. We've got a carbon carbon, 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 carbon backbone. And then we have an oxygen tying that carbon into a ring. And then we have an OH here, and an OH here, and an OH here, and again here, and again here. And this is Glucose, often abbreviated just GLU for short. Um, but not all hexoses look like that. You can also have carbon, 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 uh, carbon. Now, carbon, 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 carbon. Again, with an oxygen 
tying it together, and uh, OHs at all the other places. And uh, this one is uh, fructose, our enemy from the uh, soda industry. Okay, so those are called uh, monosaccharides. If you for one sugar, if you put them together, you can get disaccharides. Uh, and some examples of disaccharides involve if you put glucose plus glucose, you get maltose, uh, which comes from plant seeds. Uh, if you put uh, glucose plus fructose together, you get uh, sucrose, also known as table sugar. And if you put glucose plus uh, a sugar called galactose together, you get lactose, the sugar found in all mammal, uh, in the milk of all mammals that produce milk. Um, and then finally, there are um, polysaccharides. And some examples of those include uh, uh, include amylose, also known as starch, uh, glycogen, and uh, another famous one is cellulose, the paper you are uh, probably taking notes on if you're taking any notes on this lecture. Okay, properties. All carbohydrates are hydrophilic. Notice all of those OH groups. Those are going to attract water like nobody's business. These are very hydrophilic molecules. They may not all be super soluble, uh, except in perhaps hot water, because they're still large molecules that the water has to carry around. But, um, and in fact, very large molecules like cellulose uh, or amylose tend to uh, attract water to them rather than be dissolved in water. Um, you can have some real fun taking some, some cornstarch and adding some water to it and you get this paste that does some very unexpected behaviors. Uh, it sloshes from side to side in, in some cases and then in other cases it's suddenly very firm. Uh, uses and roles in the body. Simple sugars, disaccharide sugars, and starch are all part of the body's energy supply food chain. Glycogen is an energy buffer that uh, temporarily stores energy between meals. So your body will take in a lot of glucose. It can't use it all right away. So it stores it as glycogen. And then it pops glucose molecules off that glycogen whenever it needs energy between meals. There's a group of molecules called glycosaminoglycans uh, that are important uh, gel uh, molecules in connective tissues. Uh, in particular, they help kind of lubricate joint movement and they serve as a shock absorber in, in tissues. Uh, and then short polysaccharide flags are uh, posted on most of your cell surfaces to identify one cell to another. All right, now proteins are kind of a horse of a different color. They're, they are all polymers. Uh, if you call something a protein, it is a polymer. It, you know, if, if it's a single uh, subunit, uh, it's an amino acid, not a polymer. Now, the amino acids have this basic pattern. You've got uh, uh, you've got an NH2 amino group on one side of the molecule. You've got a central carbon in the middle with four bonds to it, as, as all central carbons, as all carbons have. And then you have a carbon OOH, that same C double bond OOH that we saw in the fatty acid. And so again, that's going to be called 
an acid group. So that's where it gets its name as an amino acid. What's interesting about this is that uh, you've got a hydrogen up here and you've got, uh, but then you've got this variable group, the, the last thing that sticks to the R, okay, you can't see that. Um, the last thing that sticks to the carbon, uh, its fourth bonding position is called the R group. R represents one of 20 different possibilities. Uh, the smallest of which is just a single hydrogen for glycine, and the biggest of which can involve, you know, 20 different carbons in a, a complicated arrangement. Um, R can completely change the properties of the amino acid. It can be hydrophilic or it can be hydrophobic. You can imagine that a bunch of hydrophilic uh, amino acids will want to mix with water, whereas a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids will want to all cluster together and try to get away from the water. Um, R can be acidic or neutral or basic, and that can, can have important uh, characteristics on its ability to chemically interact in its environment. Uh, it can also affect the environment it's in. Uh, R can be large and bulky, in which case it'll push neighboring amino acids away, or R can be very small, in which case it won't make any difference. Uh, R can be positive or negative, and positive and negative amino acids on different sides of a protein might attract each other, then that affects the overall shape of the protein. And then R can be chemically reactive or it can be completely inert. It, it can uh, make the chemical, it make the protein a chemically active protein or not. Now I've mentioned a couple of times the idea of uh, amino acids pushing other amino acids away or attracting them together and affecting the overall shape. That's because for proteins, more than any other biomolecule we've talked about so far, shape matters. And shape matters so much that biochemists have analyzed proteins and come up with four different levels of structure. The first is what we call the sequence or order of amino acids. So here you might have the amino acid glycine first and then the am amino acid leucine, and then the amino acid tryptophan, and then the amino acid uh, glutamic acid, and then you might have you know, many, many more. Uh, you can imagine with 20 different possibilities, there's an almost infinite number of ways you could arrange amino acids into a chain. And these amino acids are not arranged by accident. The body has recipes stored in your DNA for every single protein that your body makes. And it makes every single protein exactly the same way every time. If this protein has glycine, leucine, tryptophan, glutamate, then it will always be glycine, leucine, tryptophan, glutamate, and it will always work that way uh, every time it's made. So that's the first level. But as these amino acids interact with each other, they may push each other away or attract each other or spin each other into circles. And so we get local domain structures forming. The two most famous local domain structures uh, were developed by a fellow named Linus Pauling, and he noticed that most often you uh, either have these uh, amino acids arranging themselves into, uh, into uh, spirals, which he called an alpha helix, uh, or you find them arranging themselves into pleated patterns that form flat sheets, and he called that a beta pleated sheet. Okay, and which of these you have in a particular part of a protein makes a huge difference in the overall shape of the protein and also the structure, uh, not just the structure, but the function of that local part of the protein. Okay. Um, as you add these structures up, you can get whole polypeptide subunit structures. Okay, a polypeptide, the, uh, the bond between two amino acids where, a, where the NH3 end and the COOH end of another one come together, that's called a peptide bond. So when you start putting a lot of them together, it's called a polypeptide. So the whole polypeptide structure, uh, let's just look at alpha helices for a minute. 
um, you could arrange helices into um, such a structure that they formed a big glob and that's called a globular subunit but you could also arrange the helices in such a way that they kind of spiraled around each other and you can have more of a fibrous uh, subunit structure well if each of these is a subunit couldn't you also then have full multi subunit protein structures and again let's look at just taking a uh, a globular protein you could put a globular protein together um, in such a way that you have you know kind of a bigger globule um, that's more or less what hemoglobin looks like there or you could take these globules and arrange them in like a string of beads and then another string of add another string of beads to that and you have a long thin strand and that's kind of how collagen and actin and many of the other fibrous proteins in our body work proteins are such a big topic that they get two slides in this show um, properties we want to look at properties next and for protein structure is function so imagine a protein with lots of hydrophobic amino acids in a particular area that gives you a hydrophobic region of the molecule um, and what could that do well it could embed itself in a cell membrane and form a cell membrane channel or anchor um, or it could be in the middle of a otherwise water soluble molecule and maybe it's a carrier spot for hydrophobic hormones so that we can get them all over the body on the other hand what if you had a protein with lots of chemically reactive amino acids in a particular spot um, that produces a chemically active region which could be the active site of an enzyme or it could be a binding spot in which the protein grabs on to lots of other proteins this ability for structure to determine function uh, mixed with the fact that you have 20 different possible amino acids that can create all of these different structures makes proteins the most varied type of biomolecule in the body a side note here since structure equals function for proteins anything that denatures the structure of a protein breaks its function as well in order for a protein to work properly we have to maintain the proper temperature the proper pH so that the you know acid and acidic and basic parts of a protein will work properly together and even the proper saltiness in the environment um, a little trick if you get a uh, a biological you know stain a, a blood stain or a uh, uh, fruit juice stain in your uh, clothing rub some salt water into it and it will actually denature those proteins and start uh, make it easier to get food out of your uh, out of your clothes some uses and roles in the body uh, proteins being the most varied type of biomolecule also have the most uses and roles in the body um, inside a cell almost everything that is done by a cell is done by a protein outside the cell uh, proteins serve structural purposes collagen and elastin fibers uh, they serve chemical and transportation functions they're uh, immunolo immunological the antibodies that we rely on to protect us from diseases um, and then in the cell membrane itself proteins form channels and pumps and anchors that hold cells in place uh, and allow things to travel in and out of the cells and finally proteins are important information character carriers uh, hormones such as insulin uh, are proteins that carry information from one cell to another from one part of the body to another now you may have wondered if you have 20 different amino acids and all these different ways of arranging proteins together how can you ever manage to have one uh, uh, have a protein be made the same way twice and the answer is that we have to have recipes and the recipes for proteins are carried by a different kind of biomolecule called nucleic acids the basic monomer unit of a nucleic acid is the nucleotide it's centered on a ribose sugar 
On one side of the ribose is a phosphate molecule, PO4, and on the other side of the ribose is a ring of carbon and nitrogen called a, uh, a nitrogen base. And what makes the uh, nucleotides, what makes the nucleic acids able to carry information to store uh, recipes for proteins is that the nitrogen base has actually several different possibilities. Okay, it can be A for adenine, it can be C for cytosine, it can be G for guanine, it can be T for thymidine, or it can be U for uracil. Now, you may have noticed that I just put thymidine and uracil on the same line here. That's because thymidine is used by DNA and uracil is used by RNA. They work the same way, but one is used by DNA and the other is used by RNA. Now, that's four letters that form the entire genetic code. And so, uh, in order for four letters to represent 20 different amino acids in a recipe, uh, you have to read them in three letter words. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture uh, on biomolecule on uh, cell physiology. Okay, so uses roles in the body. Uh, I'm going to start with the lesser known ones first. Sometimes nucleotides are actually used by themselves. So the adenine nucleotide can be turned into something called ATP, and the guanine nucleotide can be turned into something called GTP, and these are used as energy carriers within the cells. Uh, the adenine nucleotide can also be turned into something called cyclic AMP, which is used as a signal molecule within your cells. Uh, but it's the polymers of nucleic acids that get everybody's attention. DNA forms a double helix with base pairs in the middle. So what you have is you have the sugar phosphate backbone that's going around like this, and then you have another sugar phosphate backbone that's coming along like this, and that's the, where you have the double helix. And then in between each, there's you know this kind of uh, base pairing going on where each each set of uh, adenine bonds to a thymidine, each uh, cytosine bonds to a guanine, and that holds the whole double helix together. I uh, apologize for the horrible drawing there. Uh, and DNA, because of the double helix nature of it, serves as a very easily copied library of genetic information. You can take, you can unzip the two strands and each one can be copied to make a new strand, and you've now got a perfect copy of your DNA. Mostly your genetic information consists of recipes for making proteins, though as we've sequenced the human genome, we found that there are in fact some, uh, some bits of genetic information that don't work that way, and we're not entirely sure what to make of those. RNA forms a single-stranded structure, or several single-stranded structures, that play various roles in protein synthesis. Uh, the most important, perhaps, is, is the messenger RNA, which makes a temporary uh, kind of a photocopy of your DNA recipe that is used to make the actual protein. But there are also uh, ribosomal RNAs and transfer RNAs that also play absolutely essential roles in protein synthesis. Okay, well, now you know the uh, four biomolecules and the basic ideas of, uh, of uh, organic and biochemistry. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, goodbye and good luck.